that it's migrating. We have no evidence of that. It's very well unknown. One of the variables we didn't talk about is that water photo dissociates very quickly, certainly within a terrestrial day on the moon. And so there's a lot of what you're hearing here is basically there's a lot of unknowns that we need to work out to try to explain what I think is a tremendous uh, set of ob observations. Yeah, there are many more, the Rob Green, there are many more questions today than we had six months ago. And, and there's going to be a lot of work, as, as Jim has said, over uh, years and probably decades, understanding this phenomena and following up on it. The next call is from Ken Kramer for, from Space Flight Magazine. Ken? Ah. Hi, thank you very much for taking my call. Yes, I wonder if you could describe a little bit more the mechanism of this water formation via the solar wind. Are you conducting any lab experiments? Um, and was this hypothesized before you got this data at all? And, and a second question, is there any, uh, what is the follow-up with uh, LRO and Deep Impact? Thank you. Uh, I'm certainly not doing any lab work yet. We haven't had time. I don't know about you, the rest of you guys. Um, at, we just said, uh, I think, most of the first question, which is we don't really know what's going on yet. And by we, we mean the, the broad community. And we certainly need more expertise than is sitting in front of you to answer these questions. Uh, to answer your deep, imp deep impact question, we have uh, sadly made our last observation of the moon uh, after we've done our last gravity assist. Um, happily, that's put us towards our primary uh, target, Hartley 2, uh, but we won't be able to do any more observations here. But uh, hy hydrogen has been found to come off uh, the uh, uh, Apollo samples, and it has, solar wind has been hypothesized to be trapped in, in the um, lunar regolith, so in the soil. So, um, you know, we expect at least some of the signal to be due to that effect. The uh, next question is from Charles Rotley at uh, examiner.com. Charles? Hello, Charles Rotley. I'm interested in the diurnal variation that was observed by deep impact, um, the lower absorption during the day and the higher absorption at the dawn and dusk. Uh, have you noticed any difference between the dawn and dusk side that might indicate if the uh, accumulation is continuous during the 14-day lunar night. You might expect to see more on the dawn side. Right. Uh, that's a very good question. Um, the, sh the answer is, we within our detectability, we don't see a difference between mor morning and evening. Uh, we don't see an accumulation at night, which you might expect if condensation was going on, for example. Uh, and that is what drove us to this concept that we had a cycle that was going on during the day. OK, we're going to come back to NASA headquarters with a question. Sir, can you give your name and affiliation? And I'm John Mulligan from the Providence Journal for Dr. Peters. I wonder if you could uh, take us back to November and relive for us the moment uh, when this information began to arrive. Where were you and what were you doing? How long did it take to apprehend uh, what was happening? What did you feel? Well, there's a lot in that question. Um, um, actually, both Rob and I were at, uh, in Bangalore when the data first started uh, arriving, and when we saw the first image, we were elated. Um, there were tears in our eyes when we saw that first image yeah. come back. It's been a long uh -huh. ride. And then uh, through the 10 months, the data have been uh, acquired. Um, uh, obviously, the ISRO uh, uh, operations uh, played a incredibly uh, 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 crucial role in, in, in carrying out this successfully, but we do, as Rob had mentioned, uh, have 90% of the surface of the moon covered at the kind of resolutions that you were looking at today. Um, getting back to the water itself, um, when the MQ team first saw this signal in our data, we, like most other teams before us, had immediately assumed, oh, this is calibration. It's not possible. The moon doesn't do this. Um, but as we discussed further, and when Roger brought in the VIMS data to, to, to show us, um, it became clear as the m cubed data accumulated, the VIM data became stronger, this was something we could not ignore. And within our team, we spent months trying to find what was wrong. Trying to disprove this. Trying to disprove it. Clearly, 
There must be something we've overlooked. We'd tried everything, and we could not find anything wrong with either our data or the VIMS data. Um, and by that time, we about decided, uh, OK, we should start writing. start writing and prepare for publication. We'll still put a caveat in there, because maybe there's something that we just haven't thought about. But then Jessica reminded us, well, you know, Deep Impact is having this calibration uh, uh, flyby. Um, and we'll be able to look at the moon. And we said, OK. So they did. And Jessica got the Deep Impact team to process that data real fast for this problem. And the rest is history now. It is completely conclusive. There is no question whatsoever. Um, and here we are. OK, we have time uh, for maybe a question or two. We've got to reconfigure for another event here. So we're going to go back to the phone line. Uh, James Dean from Florida Today. Hi, thanks. Um, other than as a resource that astronauts might be able to use, I was just wondering if you could speak a little bit to the, what the, the, the key implication of this, this finding of more widespread water is. Uh, is it, does it say something about, is it more about the understanding the formation of the moon, or, or does it suggest new possibilities for life in other places? We probably will have four different answers to that. If, um, um, let, let, me, let me start out. This is Carly. Um, uh, first thing we need to know is what the source of this, this water in H2O is. Um, uh, is it solar wind? Is it a comet? Is it uh, um, meteorites that have accumulated on the moon? Is it from the interior? There is, is a possibility that degassing from the interior from time to time. We simply don't know. Um, and those are fundamental science questions that we need to understand about this silicate body. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think I'll let, I'll let Jessica pick up the next. I, I think you did a good job, Carly. <laughs> <laughs> ah, but it does have implications. This is Jim Green, as Jessica mentioned, in yes. other nearly airless bodies in our solar system. That's also quite exciting. Thank you, yes. But it's also important because here's an, a discovery uh, uh, of a couple of ways. One, it's a method that we can use to find water uh, from orbit uh, or on the ground with landers. I mean, astronauts could use uh, instruments like these, rovers. All kinds of instruments could be used to search for water in these hot environments, uh, do probing of all kinds of things, just, not just the moon, all, all instruments. We do have imaging spectrometers around a lot of objects now. But for the moon, it's important because uh, before this press conference and before our colleagues uh, have learned about our papers, this was thought to be impossible, to have water on the surface of the moon in hot sunlight, you know, especially at the equator, let alone the higher latitudes. So it's a, a really profound discovery. Could I have a, a small addendum? Because I just thought of another one. Um, uh, and that is that, that most of us are geologists. And we get very excited about how planets form and evolve. But, but this phenomenon clearly has to be a marriage between geology and space physics. Um, and, 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 and this is going to be a really productive interaction over the next few years. OK, time for one more question <laughs> on the phone line. Raphael Jaffe from Aerotech. Aerotech News. Uh, yes. Uh, question, I guess, for Jim Green. Uh, do I understand correctly that MQ is, is like a passenger on an Indian uh, satellite that is surveying the moon? And the associated one is, is there a similar instrument on NASA's current lunar reconnaissance orbiter, which I believe is even now... Uh, mapping the moon in more detail? Um, yes, I'll take part of that question. This is Jim Green. Uh, indeed, um, NASA has opportunities uh, that we call missions of opportunity for which individual investigators may propose, and if their proposal is uh, scientifically the best, can be selected, build those instruments to fly on other agency spacecraft. And, in so, and indeed, um, M-cubed is a, a guest instrument on the Chandrayaan-1 uh, spacecraft uh, built by ISRO. Uh, in terms of uh, LRO, that is an Exploration Systems Mission Directorate mission. And Mike, 
does uh, does LRO have an M cubed? <laughs> well.